All right, good evening, everyone. My name is Jared Cannon. I'm the co-president for the Business Nerds Ham Society. And on behalf of my society and the ICE Center, I'd like to welcome you to a very special event. Tonight, we have a guest who, who took his love for music, his love for journalism, and his love for business and combined it into a profitable venture uh, about one of the art, definitely, without a, without a doubt, one of the greatest rock and roll groups of all time. So without further ado, Bill German. Thanks, Jared. And uh, thanks to the Business and Entertainment Society and the Ice Cap folks. Am I getting this on? Yes. And uh, thanks to Dean German, somewhere out there. Uh, it's great to be here. I met some of you earlier. Very excited to be here. Um, I usually start by reading the intro to the book. That's the cover of the book, uh, which I wrote called uh, Under Their Thumb, How a Nice Boy from Brooklyn Got Mixed Up with the Rolling Stones and Lived to Tell About It. Um, so here's the intro. You'll probably want to kill me when I say my only job in life was with the Rolling Stones. Even as a teenager, I wasn't mowing lawns, washing cars, or asking if you want fries with that. I was traipsing after my favorite rock band and writing about it in Beggar's Banquet, the newsletter I launched on my 16th birthday. When I published the first issue, I had no idea where it would lead or how it would dictate the course of my life. I shouldn't have been with the Stones in the first place. To be welcomed into their orbit, you have to bring something to their table, like drugs, or sex, or fame, or the ability to carry their luggage better than anyone else. But all I had was my stupid little newsletter. This is the story of how I made it into the Stones' inner sanctum and how I crawled out. It's also about the overachievers and the underachievers, the groupies, the pushers, and the flunkies that I met along the way. People who dedicated their entire lives to remaining in that sanctum. Some of them are still there, and some of them got carried off in handcuffs or caskets. But all of us lived our dream of hanging with the Rolling Stones. Be careful what you wish for. Um, so, yeah, I, just to put things into context, I, um, I'm now 48 years old, and, uh, which means I was born in 1962, September of 1962, but my story takes off, uh, the fun part of the story takes off when I was uh, roughly your age, most of you in here, or a few years younger actually. Um, and in 1978, uh, in September, I was turning 16 years old, and I loved the Rolling Stones since I was 10 years old. I knew everything about them. Uh, but in addition to loving the Stones, I also loved journalism. I was a, a teenage news junkie. I used to read all three local newspapers that they had in New York City. I would watch, uh, you know, Walter Cronkite on the evening news on CBS. Uh, I just loved news, and I knew that I wanted to be a journalist. And I especially admired the guys that were writing about my favorite rock band, like in Rolling Stone magazine. There used to be another magazine called Cream Magazine, which is now defunct. But, um, and I was like, wow, these guys get paid to hang out with the Rolling Stones. That's for me. So um, the thing is, you know, I was a teenager. And I said, well, they're not going to hire me because I'm just a teenager. And there are people that they're already sending around the world, you know, to interview the Rolling Stones. So they're not going to hire me. One way around it is I'll just start my own publication. And so that's what I did. And uh, as I said, it was September 1978. It was actually on my 16th birthday or the week of my 16th birthday. And uh, I borrowed a typewriter. You know, this is before computers. Uh, this is in the day of paper, you know, um, and magazines. And so I started my own magazine or what they used to back then call a fanzine which was like a smaller magazine that just focused on one subject. And mine was my favorite rock group, the Rolling Stones. And that's all I wrote about in my first issue. And uh, here's what one of the early issues looked like. Very professional. Yes, I know. But you know, that again, that speaks to the fact that there, you didn't have computer graphics. Everything was done on paper. When you said cut and paste, you literally meant to cut and to paste with scissors and glue. So um, although I, uh, I used a typewriter for the inside of the issue, the outside, you know, how do I get the big letters? You know, the typewriter is only that small, the letters. So to use the, get the big headlines, I had to use 
a magic marker, a Sharpie, you know. So that's what I did in my horrible penmanship. And uh, so that's one of the early issues. Um, the headline, Keith Don't Go, refers to the fact that Keith Richards had uh, been busted the year before for heroin possession, of course, uh, in Canada, and he was on trial. Uh, so Keith Don't Go, he was really possibly going to go to prison. Stones Live from New York was the fact that the Stones were appearing on Saturday Night Live then. And, uh, you know, my early issue, uh, I was just a kid. I didn't have, like, any sources or anything. Basically, I was just telling you the same thing that was already in the newspaper or already in TV Guide. You know, the Rolling Stones are going to be on Saturday Night Live. So I didn't have any exclusive information. Um, but the point is, I love the Rolling Stones. I love journalism. And so this, you know, gave me an excuse to, you know, put together this little newsletter. So, um, like I said, it was all cut and paste uh, with scissors and glue, laying it out. And then the other problem is getting it printed. Again, you couldn't just print it on a computer. And uh, because nobody had a computer. <laughs> I mean, nobody I knew anyway. And so you had to find a place that would print it for you. Now, back then, uh, the only places that had copy machines were banks, uh, libraries, and some college campuses would have like a little copy shop. So uh, I actually convinced a friend of mine who worked in the high school mimeograph room. Uh, he, like me, he was a, a junior starting 11th grade. He worked as a volunteer in the mimeograph room. And so does anybody here know what mimeograph is? And it's okay, I see <laughs> some folks here. Okay, but uh, so mimeograph, for those of you who don't know what it is, uh, it was just a printing process with a very smelly, inky thing that went around and around and printed out your exams and all that stuff that schools used to, you know, hand out. Um, and it smelled great. So as crappy as this looked, at least it smelled great. Um, and my friend who had the keys to the mimeograph room, he um, got me in there after hours. And so uh, we didn't tell the teachers, didn't tell the principal, and I printed about 100 copies of the issue. And uh, you know, the next problem was uh, what to do with it. And uh, unfortunately, you know, none of the kids back then in Brooklyn were into the Rolling Stones. They were into disco, most of them, uh, at that time. Uh, they all loved the movie Saturday Night Fever. A lot of them were very similar to the guys that are on the Jersey Shore right now. All those guys, that's who I grew up with. So I kind of stuck out like a sore thumb with my hair long and into rock and roll, the Rolling Stones. Um, so I, I had like no customers. I tried to sell it for 25 cents each and nobody took a single copy at my school. And uh, you know, it, it was slow going at first. But uh, the point is, I was uh, very determined to stick with it because I just, I loved it. You know, I love the Rolling Stones. I love journalism. I was taking a journalism class uh, at my high school, which was great that my high school offered journalism. And uh, I, I decided to stick with it because of my love for the Stones and my love for journalism. And I eventually started putting into practice some of the elements of professional journalism, which is I developed actual sources. You know, like I was saying, when I, when I first started, I didn't have any sources. I was just reprinting what was already in the newspaper. But I started to get first-hand sources. And one of the things that helped was location, location, location. I was living in New York City. The Rolling Stones were living in New York City. And they were going out to nightclubs like three nights a week where they would sometimes get up on stage uh, just with like local bands. And so that's what I started reporting on. And so, um, you know, just by sticking with it, it started to get a little more professional looking. And um, I started to get to know some photographers or, you know, even back then they referred to them as paparazzi, but they weren't as hated back then as they are now because they, uh, they were not as annoying as they are now and it wasn't as competitive. These were just guys who brought their cameras to you know, rock and roll nightclubs, and if the Stones walked in, they would take their picture, and I would put it into my newsletter. And so, uh, through word of mouth, the newsletter started to take off. Like, hey, there's this kid, you know, if you're sitting in Kansas, let's say, and, you know, you're a big Rolling Stones fan, and the Rolling Stones are living in New York, you know, wow, here's a kid in New York City, 
even though I'm like 16, 17, 18 years old at that point. But I, I was scooping all these major magazines by having friends who were older than me and seeing the stones in these nightclubs. Because I was under the drinking age, so I couldn't even get into these nightclubs. But, uh, but I knew adults who were, and they would tell me, oh, you know, Keith came last night, and, you know, he met up with this person and that person, and he got up on stage and played. And, you know, that, uh, you know, gave my newsletter some cachet uh, that I was getting all this exclusive stuff. I also started taking, um, started taking ads out in places like Rolling... Can you hear me, by the way? Is that you? Okay. I started taking ads out in places like Rolling Stone magazine, little tiny ads that would bring in like 100 subscribers or so. Um, and I was charging uh, just $3 for a year's subscription. And uh, people would send me, you know, $3 bills in the mail to my bedroom. And then uh, I was, you know, I was still living with my parents. Um, and I would send them the newsletter, you know. And I, I was telling some students here earlier that you know, part of business is developing trust with your customers. And that was the thing, you know, they sent me $3 at the beginning of the year, and then it was my obligation to send them their issues for the rest of the year. And, you know, I just developed this strong sense of responsibility that I owe something to my customers, to my readers. And it was just something that got instilled in me early on. And, uh, you know, and I, and I took it very seriously. So, you know, once it started to look a little bit better and my news got a little more exclusive and things like that, I said, you know, I would really love it if the band themselves got to see my little creation. And so, uh, like I said, I was too young to get into most of these nightclubs. The drinking age was 18 and uh, I was under that age. But I found out that they were having a party at a club on 38th Street in New York City. And I said, well, I'm just going to show up with a copy of my newsletter and give it to them. And so that's what you're looking at there. That's the picture that was in on the cover of the book. And so uh, that's me in the background. And um, Keith Richards in the foreground. Uh, you, you also might note that he's got a bottle of Jack Daniels that he <laughs> pilfered from the party. Um, and so I just waited for them to come out of the party. Uh, you could probably tell it was the daytime, which is pretty rare, but this was a you know, I, I didn't think Keith Richards got up before, like five, six o'clock. But this was um, an afternoon party uh, because they wanted it to be on the six o'clock news. So the Stones show up to this party at this nightclub. I wait for them to come out. Um, Mick Jagger comes out first, and he is, um, you know, not always the nicest guy, Mick. So he comes out and he kind of puts out a vibe, like, yeah, don't come near me. You know, he didn't say that, but that was his vibe. He didn't know anything about me or who I was. But, you know, and I didn't take it personally because that's Mick. But then Keith Richards and Ron would come out and, uh, you know, and Keith is like the opposite, you know, and he's standing around and, you know, hey, man, how are you? Hey, nice to meet you. What do you want, an autograph? You know? But me, actually, and there were other fans on the street. I didn't want an autograph. My only goal was to give them a copy of the newsletter and let them know I exist. I wanted to do that as a fan and as a journalist. Let them know I exist and let's see where, how this you know, plays out. So that's me, and I am actually handing Ron Wood, the other guitarist in the Stones, uh, but he's cut off here, but that's his hand, and I am handing a newsletter to him, almost like a process server, just putting it into his hands. And, um, and he was amused by it, you know. He's like, wow, this looks pretty nice, you know. And they get into their limo, and I could see them. For some reason, the window was rolled down, and I could see them sitting in the back of the limo, and they're looking at my little newsletter that I created in my pajamas when I'm 16 years old and got printed at my high school mimeograph room. Um, and I'm like, wow, my favorite rock star is like now recognize some piece of work of mine. So, um, so the other interesting thing about this photo actually, oh, uh, so I'm 17 years old there and it's two days after my high school graduation, by the way. And uh, so in some ways it's like I had two graduations that week, you know, one from one from high school and one from being a person who had never met the Rolling Stones into someone who did meet the Rolling Stones. And probably the latter had a bigger impact on my life. <laughs> but um, so the interesting thing about this photo is that I didn't even know that it existed. I, you know, this was taken by one of those paparazzi photographers who was hanging outside the club. And 
uh, years later, I didn't know that this moment was captured on film. Years later, uh, I was going through, uh, I was doing some research and I visited this particular paparazzi photographer and I'm going through his files of photos and I'm like, oh my God, there's me. This captures the moment that I met the Rolling Stones for the first time. So I knew immediately that that had to be the cover of the book. And the fact that Keith has his thumb out, almost like he's hitchhiking, and that the title of my book is called Under Their Thumb, it was just too good of a coincidence to avoid. So that made it as the cover of my book. But um, the thing is, you know, like I said earlier, persistence, persistence, persistence. And so even when people tell you, you know, like, well, what the heck are you doing? If it's your parents or your friends, I mean, I got a lot of you know, discouraging comments from everybody. I mean, even my journalism teacher, when I finally showed it to him, he was like, you know, you really should be covering more important topics than a rock band. And I was like, that may be, but I love this. And this is a way to marry my hobby with my intended career, you know? So uh, there was no stopping me, you know? My parents, you know, to their credit, they didn't really discourage me, but they didn't encourage me either. I think they thought maybe it was just a phase that I was going through. Um, but, you know, it's an odd thing that a kid wants to, you know, write a, a newsletter about his favorite rock group and do it for a living. Um, but uh, so I just I kept persisting in making sure that the Rolling Stones got my issues all the time. And uh, I started to figure out some of the nightclubs that they were going to. And so that's me. Uh, giving the latest issue to Keith Richards, that's his uh, girlfriend at the time, Patty Hansen, now uh, his wife for the past 25 or so years. Um, and, um, and just making sure that they never forgot about me and that they kept seeing my work. And I would also drop issues off at their office. They had an office called Rolling Stones Records in Rockefeller Center. And uh, I would just keep going up there and without making a pest out of myself, but always being around and, you know, and kind of like branding myself and making sure that they never forgot who I was or the product that I had here. And, you know, what was reassuring is, you know, I would go up to someone like Keith at one of these nightclubs. By now, I, I'm drinking age. Uh, go up to Keith at one of these nightclubs and say, hey, do you have the latest issue? And he would say something like, uh, yeah, yeah, I just read this one on the can, you know. It's like, wow, Keith Richards is reading my work on the can, you know. Um, or yeah, here's Ron Wood. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, I've got this one. Where's the next one, you know. So I was getting all this encouragement, and, you know, and I'm a teenager. And I was like, this, like wow, the Rolling Stones know about me, and they know that I exist. Um, so I started going to NYU and uh, where I majored in journalism and uh, I went for about a year or so uh, until I uh, until the Rolling Stones decided to have their Tattoo U tour in 1981 which started here in Philadelphia at JFK Stadium and uh, I decide that I want to follow the tour because I need to cover it for the newsletter I have you know at that point my circulation was around a thousand or so maybe more I'm trying to remember but it was around a thousand, which ain't bad for you know a teenage kid who you know was just having people send him money in the mail to his bedroom. So um, I had a not so easy conversation with mom and dad one breakfast, where I tell them that I am quitting NYU to follow the Stones around the country. And um, I mean, once we picked mom up off the floor, um, you know, they they. They gave me a lot of trust. Again, you know, people have given me a lot of trust in my life, and I never wanted to abuse that trust. And so I didn't abuse it, but I did go and follow the Rolling Stones for a year on tour. And, um, and that was one of the issues here. Um, this is from their 1981 tour, and I traveled around a bit. Saw them in a small theater in Atlanta. I saw them... Uh, down in Florida, I saw them in, their closing show was in Virginia. This is a big YouTube clip, actually. Um, maybe you guys have seen it, but uh, I don't know what you would have to type in to find it on YouTube, but it's a clip of a fan running on stage during the concert, and Keith Richards takes his guitar off and swings it at this kid that ran on stage, puts his guitar back on like nothing happened. The kid gets dragged off, never to be heard from again. Um, 
But that's Keith Richards for you. But I was at that show in Virginia. It was the final show of the tour, and they had a big party afterwards, and I got to go backstage. And so my relationship with the Stones is growing and growing, and my relationship with the people that work for the Stones. And, uh, you know, things just started snowballing for me. And, uh, you know, I keep going along, reporting about the Rolling Stones, and making sure that they get the issues. And then uh, one day what happens, um, and this is after I had quit NYU, and, which by the way, I am not uh, you know, condoning dropping out of school. Let me make that clear. Somehow it worked out for me, I don't know. And I do have regrets about it, you know, um, which we can get into if you want. But, but anyway, um, so I don't recommend quitting school. There's a lot of good stuff you can learn. But um, I, uh, I then moved out of my parents' house and, you know, when I was living at my folks, I didn't need to make that much money. So I could charge three, four, five dollars uh, for a subscription, you know, whatever, times a thousand. I could live on four, five, six thousand dollars a year. That was fine. Um, but then once I moved into my own apartment, even though I had a, a roommate, uh, you know, I needed to make a little bit more money. And that's when I realized, like, wow, this, you know, I was at the crossroads. Either this is going to be my living or not. And by, well, not really coincidence or luck because you make your own luck, but I get a phone call from the Rolling Stones management telling me that Mick and Keith love your newsletter so much that they have decided that they want your little newsletter that you started in your pajamas when you were 16 years old. They want it to be their official newsletter. And it will be advertised in their next album, which is an album called Undercover. And so that's the ad that got put in there. And all these fans um, sent their money to an address in Los Angeles. Um, and then I was paid a salary by the Rolling Stones, by my favorite rock group in the world. And like, wow, now it's all official. And uh, so when they first called me, their management saying, you know, we want to turn your little newsletter into the official newsletter. Uh, you know, they said, well, you know, we're going to advertise it in the next album and you'll get to, uh, you know, go to the Stones houses, you'll get to interview them, you'll get to go on the road with them and go into the recording studios with them. Is that okay with you? <laughs> so I said, yeah, yeah, that's, that's okay. Um, and, so, and at that point, I was 20 years old in the summer of 1983 when that whole deal got consummated. And uh, next thing I know, I am indeed interviewing Mick Jagger uh, at his house on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Um, this photo was not taken at his house, but around that same time at a party. Um, and so that's me and Mick. The guy on the left is some bodyguard that I never saw before or after. But, um, uh, and so it was the day after my 21st birthday, actually. And that's like not a bad gift, right? A bad birthday gift. So um, I interviewed Mick. He's not as good an interview as Keith, to be honest. Mick can give you like one word answers or one sentence answers where Keith can go on forever and ever. Uh, but, uh, but Mick was pretty nice to me that day. The only problem is, is um, I ask him to round out the interview. I say, what, uh, what music are you listening to? He says, oh, let me go check. Yeah. And he goes into the corner of the room and he's flipping through his albums. And, you know, back then it was still LPs, vinyl LPs. And he's telling me, well, you know, I'm listening to Herbie Hancock and Bette Midler. And he's telling me all this. And while he's doing that, I say, let me see what books he's reading. And I stand up to look at his bookcase. And as I do that, this is my, my first time at Mick Jagger's house, one of the most famous people in the world. And I... I accidentally knock over a glass of orange juice that I had at my feet, and I am now watching it pour all over Mick Jagger's 16th century Persian rug. And I'm like, Mick, Mick, and he's not there. I don't know where he is. And I'm just, I'm 21 years and one day old, standing over my glass of Minute Maid orange juice, rolling over this priceless rug, and I feel like an idiot, um, and I don't know what to do. But apparently Mick had seen the whole thing and he came back into the room with a towel and he gets down on his hands and knees to blot up my mess. And that is a vision I will never forget for the rest of my life. And he couldn't have been nicer about it, actually. He's very gracious. Nah, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And I was like, oh, please don't tell your living girlfriend, Jerry Hall, you know, that I did this. He says, nah, don't worry. Besides, this is my room. 
So I was like, oh, okay, okay. Uh, the other interesting thing about that interview was um, at one point the phone rings and, uh, and it just keeps ringing and ringing. The answering machine wasn't picking up. And, uh, and finally Mick does pick it up and he puts on some kind of like, weird accent. It sounded to me like an old Spanish lady. You know, Hello? And then he recognizes the person and says, oh yeah, hang on. And it was for his girlfriend, Jerry Hall. And, uh, you know, he yells down to her, like, hey, you know, Jerry, you got to pick up the phone. We're trying to do an interview here. But the, it made me realize that I think Mick Jagger screens his own phone calls by pretending to be his cleaning lady. <laughs> and it happened another time. Once when I called him, he picked up the phone. Hello? And I said, hi, can I speak to Mick? Who's calling? Bill Jeremy. Oh, hi, Bill. <laughs> okay. So, as if interviewing Mick Jagger the day after my 21st birthday wasn't enough for three hours at his house, I then go to interview Keith Richards on the same day, also for three hours, at his office, um, or the Rolling Stones office, which that is not their office, um, <laughs> but uh, it could be, you know. Um, and of course, there's the ja bottle of Jack Daniels again. And I, uh, there I am showing Keith uh, the first official issue of my newsletter, Beggar's Banquet. And, um, and like I said, Keith is a much better interview than Mick. He could give really philosophical and, um, and very introspective, and he's very honest. And I got him to open up about his drug addictions. I got him to open up about the fact that he um, had not spoken to his father in 20 years, and they had just reunited, like right before I interviewed him. So he had some great insight into that. Um, but one of the most interesting things that happened during my, it was actually after the interview, was uh, we leave the building where the Stone's office was. Like I said, it was in Rockefeller Center. And uh, it's like nine o'clock at night at this point. And so the, ele the regular elevators are not working and we had to take like a service elevator. Uh, and as we're waiting for the elevator, a guy shows up with a mop and pail. He's a porter, obviously. And um, Keith starts talking to this guy like he knows him. And guess what? Obviously, he does know him. He's like, hey, how you been, man? You're right? Your daughter just started school, right? How's she doing? You know? I was like, wow, Keith knows about this guy's daughter. You know? And he kept up the conversation during our elevator ride. And I realized that in those two or three minutes, I got almost as much insight into Keith Richards' character as I did in the three hours I interviewed him, which is that he's a regular guy and he loves to be around regular people. And um, I have to admit, that's a little bit of where Mick and Keith differ, I think. Mick is a little bit more of a jet setter and a, uh, a social climber uh, than Keith is, in my opinion, anyway. Um, so, uh, you know, I get to interview Mick and Keith, and I get all this new access, and it's great. And that's uh, the cover of the first official issue. Um, uh, yes, uh, Keith got married, and so I'm talking about that. Um, Arms Build Up refers to a benefit concert that was called Arms. Uh, the Undercover album was their new album. Mick and Keith discussed the Undercover, so that was my interview with them, interviews with them. Um, Keith gets hitched. So, um, but the thing that I learned early on is that there was a bit of a trade-off. And uh, as a journalist and as a business person, you know, I had to decide if it was worth it. Um, I got all this great access, but the Stones, I was now part of the Stones business plan because they were selling these subscriptions and paying me a salary. And so they got to, you know, have a say in what goes into the newsletter. And so, for instance, this was, that photo was not my first choice. My first choice was a close-up of Mick and Keith, which I actually I had I showed you a few minutes ago was on that flyer. So actually like a million people saw it on that flyer and then Mick decides he doesn't want it on this cover. And uh, unfortunately, it was already being printed, the original cover, and so we had to destroy 20,000 copies of the cover, all because Mick, you know, changed his mind in the last minute. And, you know, I learned that early on, like, wow, these guys might not be so easy to deal with. And uh, I wrote something about the Stones shooting a video in Mexico City, and I, they were guests of honor at a party. And I wrote that all the Stones were there except for Mick, well, Mick didn't like that because he didn't want to be conspicuous by his absence. 
And one of the reasons he was absent from that party is that uh, he was down there in Mexico City, how shall we say, um, pursuing some other taco, uh, which would have been fine if he was a carefree single guy, but his girlfriend, Jerry Hall, was back home in New York seven months pregnant. Uh, but he didn't want her to figure that out. So I had to reword the whole article and, you know, and I, I did because now I'm working for Mick, you know, Jerry Hall, his girlfriend could connect her own dots, you know. Uh, then Bill Wyman, uh, the bass player for the Stones, uh, I met him at that ARMS concert afterwards and he introduced me to his girlfriend uh, and I ran a picture of him and his girlfriend, uh, you know, or I wanted to run a picture of him and his girlfriend and he said, no, don't, don't print that picture. I'm like, why? And well, it turns out that that was just his New York girlfriend. And he didn't want the New York girlfriend to find out about the LA girlfriend, the LA girlfriend to find out about the San Francisco girlfriend, and on and on and on. So he just said, don't print pictures of me with anybody. And I go, OK, fine. Um, then I hear from Keith Richards' manager. She didn't like the fact that I used the word stumbled. I said something like, Keith stumbled into a nightclub to catch a certain band. you know, And she, she didn't like it. I said, why? It's just a figure of speech. And she said, no, stumbled might imply that Keith was stoned, and we wouldn't want anyone to think that. <laughs> so, um, but through it all, and through all the hassles of like, their managers and lawyers and accountants, you know, I, I remain very close to the guys in the band, um, specifically Keith Richards and Ron Wood. That's us checking out the latest issue of my newsletter. Uh, and this was taken at a recording studio in New York City at about 5 o'clock in the morning in 1985. I am 22 years old there. Uh, in the summer of 1985, and uh, Keith told me to stop by, you can stop by the studio anytime, man, you know, as long as Brenda's not there. I'm like, Brenda? Who's Brenda? I don't know any Brenda. Well, it turns out that Brenda was uh, Keith's nickname for Mick, and it was not a term of endearment, and it was behind Mick's back, and it was just like the little secret amongst a small clique of people. And uh, it had to do with the fact that Mick and Keith started hating each other in the early to mid 80s, and, um, which was the result of Mick wanting to go solo. And Keith, you know, always puts the Stones first. He is the Stones' number one fan and, you know, president of the company and all that. Uh, so he couldn't believe that Mick wanted to strike out on his own. And that started a rift that in some ways still goes to this day. Um, but they really hated each other, and so when they recorded this album uh, in this studio, which was known as the Dirty Work album, um, Mick was hardly ever there, or at least they were not there at the same time. Mick would come in and sing his parts, and Keith would come in and play his parts, and Keith and Ron Wood wrote most of the songs on it, whereas normally Mick would contribute. Here it was just Keith and Ron Wood, and the interesting thing is that they were writing songs about how much they hate Mick, and then Mick would come in and sing them to himself, basically not realizing it. And that's why if, you, if, from, if you're familiar with that album, Dirty Work, there's all these like, really violent songs on there. There's one called One Hit to the Body. There's one called I Want to Fight. There's one called I've Had It With You. And basically, Keith Richards is telling Mick Jagger, I've had it with you. And then Mick comes in and you know, looks at the lyric sheet and you know, starts singing the song to himself. Um, and there was another song actually that got left off that album called I'm Gonna Knock Your Teeth Out One by One. <laughs> so it just tells you the, the state of the Stones' uh, health, emotional health at that point. Um, but it was really great that they welcomed me up there. I mean, I, I was just 22 years old there and they were telling me to come by. Um, and again, you know, I could only come up if Mick wasn't there because they had these separate factions. And so if you're a friend of Mick's, you couldn't be there when Keith was there. And when Keith was there, you couldn't be, you know, uh, if Keith was there, then, you know, none of Mick's friends could be there when Keith is there. None of Keith's friends could be around when Mick was there, that, that kind of thing. Uh, and Mick would bring up certain musicians like Duran Duran, who Keith despised. But like when Keith wasn't around, Mick would bring up members of Duran Duran and whatever, where Keith was bringing in like old blues guys who he felt were at least more attached to the Rolling Stones history. Uh, so Keith just developed all these resentments towards Mick, but he always made me welcome in the studio. Um, but this was a sign that Keith put in the studio. I don't know how well you can read it, but so I'll read it for you in Keith's voice. Um, Stop. This is a closed session. Do not enter. No exceptions. Even if you met Mick or Ronnie in a club and they said call in, do not enter. And then you see the skull and crossbones. And then I don't know if you could see on the bottom, he wrote, have a nice day. 
Um, so that was posted outside the studio uh, to keep the riffraff out, or to keep mixed friends out anyway. Uh, so I was really flattered that they welcomed me. Um, and so the, uh, the Stones released their Dirty Work album, and around that same time, sadly, um, one of their original members, uh, a guy named Ian Stewart, passed away. Um, that's not Ian Stewart in there. Um, Ian Stewart was their original piano player, um, and he was kind of, they used to refer to him as a sixth member of the Rolling Stones. Um, and he passed away at the age of 47 of a heart attack, which was kind of ironic because he was the one member around the Stones that didn't do drugs or booze or smoke or anything, but he drops dead of a heart attack. And the Stones, you know, just felt terribly about it. And so they um, went to London, where Ian Stewart uh, lived and died, and um, did a, a special invitation-only memorial concert for him at a club called the 100 Club in London. And uh, Ian Stewart knew a lot of other rock stars, not just the Stones. And so there you see Pete Townsend getting up on stage uh, with the Stones. And I was there for that. In fact, so I was 23 years old, flew over to England for the first time in my life, got a passport just so that I could go to this show. When Keith and Ronnie invited me and said that there was a possibility that the Stones are going to play in a small nightclub, I got very excited. And if it wasn't exciting enough to see the Five Stones playing, then you have Pete Townsend coming up, and Eric Clapton got up, and Jeff Beck got up, and Jack Bruce. I assume most of you know all those people. Um, and so it was very exciting for me. And like I said, it was my first time in London going to that show. And I conducted some interviews there uh, for the newsletter while I was there. And, um, and then there was another night where the Stones received a lifetime Grammy Award, which was kind of interesting. Um, did, did you guys see Mick Jagger the other night on the Grammy Awards? Anybody? Yeah. I thought he was pretty good, right? Not bad for 67 years old. So the ironic thing is that in 1986, some, you know, 20 two years into the Stones' career. They started like 1964, really actually earlier, but um, they never won a Grammy. I mean, they had all these big hit songs, Satisfaction, Jumping Jack Flash, whatever, never won a Grammy. Um, and then in 1986, they were being given the Lifetime Achievement Award. And they, thought they were like a little insulted in a way uh, because that award is usually given out to some 90-year-old composer that they have to wheel out you know, with an oxygen tank. And so they were like a little insulted, but they agreed to do it. Now, the thing is, for it to be uh, live in America, they had to do it at 2 o'clock in the, no, wait, 3 o'clock in the morning in London for it to be 10 p.m. East Coast time in America. So the Stones and I and some other people, we all went to this club in London where it was shown via satellite back to America. Um, and so this is me and Keith Richards leaving that club and at this point, it's about 5 o'clock in the morning. And um, Keith comes up to me and uh, grabs me the, under the arm. This is when we were still inside. Uh, and he says, uh, William, you're coming with me. I'm like, where are we going? We're going to Clapton's house. He's like, OK. <laughs> and so that's uh, me and Keith. I have no idea who this woman is in the middle. I never saw her before or since she was not with us. But that's me and Keith getting into a limousine in London outside this nightclub where the Grammy thing was, uh, you know, filmed. And, uh, okay, and now we're going to Eric Clapton's house. So this was not Clapton's, like, big estate, uh, you know, in the country. This was um, his, like, crash pad in the city uh, or his flat. Um, and so, you know, it was pretty cool you know, to be at Eric Clapton's house. And uh, he kept asking me how old I was, and I didn't tell him because I, I would try to avoid telling the Stones how old I was because I thought it could be used against me that I was so young. You know, I'm 23. They're in their 40s, mid 40s. And, you know, and it's not just them, but the people around them. I thought maybe I couldn't be taken seriously. And so, you know, as a, a young person trying to start up your own business, if you are in the business world, you know, that's something maybe, you know, that is a little scary is ageism. But I guess it works both ways. If people are too old or they could be too young. But, you know, at that time, I, I was scared I was maybe a little too young. So I didn't tell Eric Clapton how old I was. But he figured it out and says, uh, I bet you're 23. And I was like, yes. But anyway, so we hang out at his house until about 7 o'clock in the morning. And we're getting ready to leave. And the thing is, um, Clapton was moving out of his house the next day. So we had no furniture, and we were sitting on like 
uh, just like, you know, like milk crates and like folding chairs. And uh, the only thing that Eric Clapton had in his house of any value was uh, several crates of booze in the corner of the living room. And so as we're leaving, you know, Keith Richards and Ron Wood and me, we're leaving Clapton's house at seven o'clock in the morning. Clapton says to them, uh, hey guys, wait a second. Uh, you know, I'm moving out tomorrow and like, you know, I'm just gonna leave this booze here for the landlord. I mean, so why don't you guys take it? And it was winter, and so Keith, and I guess you could see he's kind of wearing a winter coat. So Keith and Ron Wood run back with their winter coats that had these big pockets and just start putting bottles of Jack Daniels down their pockets. And as Keith passes Eric Clapton on the way out, he says, is this a cigarette? He's like, glad to be of service. <laughs> and I was like, great. So, um, so anyway, we all come back to New York, and now it's... Uh, you know, early 1986, and the Dirty Work album, like I said, Mick and Keith had this rift, and that to this day, they still haven't really patched up. They're more business partners than friends, I could tell you. Um, and at that time, they still hated each other, and Mick didn't want to have anything to do with the promotion of the Dirty Work album. So Keith wound up doing all the interviews, and here he is um, after an interview with Paul Schaefer on the left, that's me in the middle, and Keith here. Uh, and that's Paul Schaefer when he still had some hair, Paul Schaefer from the David Letterman Show. And what we're looking at actually is that Paul Schaefer gave Keith a copy of my newsletter to autograph and Keith had just given it back to him and so we're all kind of laughing at that. Another interesting story about this is that um, Keith had to sing one of his songs. He has a song on the Dirty Work album called Sleep Tonight. And so he was going to sing it on national TV, uh, but he forgot the lyrics which, well, that's Keith. Well, it turns out that I had a copy of the album with me because I wanted Keith to sign it for a contest I was running. And every issue of my newsletter, I have a contest for some kind of autographed, autographed item. So uh, I needed Keith to sign their Dirty Work album. And so I had it with me. And I, you can't really see it here, but it's resting here is their album. And on the inner, in the inner sleeve of the album, has all the lyrics, which I guess, you know, when you download something on iTunes, you, you can't get the lyrics immediately. But uh, there it was on the old vinyl cover. And uh, so Keith used it as a cheat sheet. I said, hey, Keith, why don't you use this? And so he did. And that's how he was able to sing his song on national TV. But anyway, we, after this, we, we walked outside the TV studio. Uh, this, by the way, was for a show called Friday Night Videos, which like, has been off the air for many years. But anyway. Um, so we were all chatting and kibitzing outside on the street, and it was a relatively quiet street. And it was a residential street, even though it had a TV studio on it. But it was a residential street, and we, we were really making a lot of noise. It was like 2, 3 in the morning. And, well, the cops show up. And, um, and so this squad car pulls up. You know, we're all standing on the street. Squad car pulls up. These two cops get out and say, hey, guys, you know, can you keep it down? We're getting some complaints here from the neighbors. And uh, oh, my God, it's Keith Richards. <laughs> and so they get his autograph. Um, I think that's there. He has his autograph in his hand, probably on a ticket, you know, a, a parking ticket. Or something. And, um, uh, and by the way, one good thing is, you know, Keith has a doctor's bag there. And we won't even discuss what kind of medicine he probably had in his doctor's bag. But it's a good thing the cops didn't ask to see it. But um, the interesting thing is that I made sure, I had a friend of mine who was one of those paparazzi photographers when they were still nice guys, paparazzi. And I said, hey, you got to get a picture of Keith Richards with two of New York's finest. And the reason is, is at that time, this was like an incredibly rare photo and signified the changing of the guard. Because, I mean, these guys were in their 20s. Now, when Keith Richards was starting out in the 1960s and 70s, um, cops would bust the Rolling Stones all the time. You know? So trust me, the last time that Keith Richards was photographed with the police, he was not smiling. So, but this is the changing of the garden. Keith himself said to me, as soon as they got back in their squad car, he said like, you know, that it's amazing how it's changed and now they want my autograph. Like their fathers on the force probably busted me. But now, you know, they want my autograph and everything is, okay, you know, okay. So um, I was 23 years old and Ron Wood hires me. He's the other guitarist. He's the one with the spiky hair. Um, he decides he's going to do a book that's half 
art because he was like a closet artist, half art and half autobiographical. And he wants me, 23 years old, to be the ghost writer. And so I started going to his house. He was living on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. I was living on the Upper East Side. So we were right across Central Park from each other. And that's his basement. Um, and so you could see some of his artwork, a portrait he did of Chuck Berry, of Keith Moon. Over his right shoulder is Bob Marley. Um, but he also, yeah, this is also his recording studio, obviously. He's got guitars all over the place. You could see the drum kit there and some amplifiers. And um, the great thing, you know, I would go there three nights a week. I would first get there at around midnight and we'd work until like seven, eight o'clock in the morning. And the fun part of being at Ron Wood's house is that you never would know who might show up in the middle of the night. The doorbell rings and well, it's Mick Jagger. So, you know, Mick came in. I remember one particular night, Mick comes in and he decides that he wants to um, record a demo for his next solo album which if Keith Richards had found out that Mick is already plotting his next solo album instead of wanting to work with the Stones, like Keith would have strangled Mick and Ronnie Wood on the spot. But anyway, so Mick and Ron Wood and me, we all come down to this basement and Mick starts recording this song and then Mick asks me to sing back vocals with him. Which if you had told me when I was like, you know, 10 years old getting into the Rolling Stones that one day Mick Jagger would ask me to sing back vocals, for him, I would have had you committed. But he was really nice. Like I said, you know, he could be very nice, but then there are times when he's not so nice. In fact, I have a chapter in my book called A Nice Bunch of Guys, and it's all about Mick because he does have these multiple personalities, and he'll, he'll be nice to you when it suits him to be nice to you, and he'll be nasty to you when he can be nasty to you. And I've seen it with tons of different people, you know, that he's treated them that way, just this 50-50 kind of thing. Um, so on this particular night, uh, when Mick comes over and he's encouraging me to sing back up with him and I figure, well, this is my time to show Mick Jagger, my Mick Jagger impersonation. Uh, unfortunately, I got a little too nervous in front of him and I, I think I sounded more like Dwight D. Eisenhower than Mick Jagger <laughs> and he had no idea what I was trying to do, but he was still like really nice and very warm. He encouraged me to play tambourine in the background, which I did not do. Um, but then uh, we were playing the music too loud and the cops come. This is like a, you see a trend here. And so the cops come, they rang the doorbell and Ron Wood's wife answers it. And Ron Wood runs upstairs to talk to the cops, leaving me and Mick Jagger in the basement alone. And like a few minutes earlier, Mick and I were like best pals. He's asking me to sing back up. Well, all of a sudden he turns on me now that we're alone and says, I don't like what you wrote. I don't like it. It's not true at all. And it was something that I had written about the Stones playing at Live Aid, which, you know, happened down here at JFK Stadium in 1985. And it had to do with the fact that the Stones really did not want to play at Live Aid. And they didn't as a group, as you may know. Mick played separately, and then Keith and Ron Wood played with Bob Dylan. Um, but they didn't, none of them wanted to do it, actually. And they kind of had a pact that they weren't going to do it. But then, you know, slowly they caved into emotional blackmail because the word got out that they would be playing at this thing. And so now, if they didn't, you know, the word falsely got put out there that they were playing. So now if they pulled out, I mean, it would look like they pulled out if they didn't do it. And so in my opinion, they were emotionally blackmailed. Mick took offense at that, and he was letting me know, I'm 23 years old, and I'm being chewed out by one of the most famous rock stars in the world. I don't like it. I don't like it. It's not true. How dare you? How dare you? And he gets into my face, and I'm like literally and figuratively backing up from him, but he was like coming after me and didn't stop until Ron Wood came back down. So, you know, that's the, you know, the not nice Mick. So, you know, that's the thing about Mick Jagger. Um, you know, and I think Keith Richards and Ron Wood come off in my book looking better than you could have hoped. And Mick Jagger, you know, maybe not so much. Um, but my goal was just to tell a true story, and I feel that's what I did. So a couple other nights, you know, doorbell rings, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning, and it's Keith Richards. And, you know, I mean, if you ask me what, like, some of my favorite moments are during my whole time doing this, it is the musical moments. And so Keith Richards and Ron Wood are sitting at Ron Wood's kitchen table, and they're playing Beatles songs and uh, Buddy Holly songs. And I am getting, you know, like a concert from two-fifths of the Rolling Stones at a kitchen table. And, you know, those are some of my favorite moments ever, you know, in this whole thing. 
And um, I should say that one night, actually, it devolved into a farting contest. <laughs> and I, these guys, like, had, I don't know how they were able to fart on, on Will. You know, they were just on demand. They were whatever. Like Keith would sing, uh, that'll be the day that I, and let one out. I was like, <laughs> I was like Keith, you, you are a farter figure to me. Um, but anyway, those are some of my f most fun times, just hanging out when it was just like totally casual and, you know, just the musical moments. So another night, doorbell rings, 3 o'clock in the morning. Who can this be? And by the way, Ron Wood did have a, um, a video camera at the front door, but like so many other things in his life, it was broken. And so we never knew. The doorbell would ring, and we would just open the door. Well, one time we opened the door, and it's Stevie Ray Vaughan standing there with his guitar strapped on already. He did not have a guitar case or a gig bag or anything. It's just the guitar already strapped on. And Ron Wood, you know, said to him, like, did you actually hail a taxi from your hotel like that with the guitar strapped on? And of course, the answer was yes. And so then the three of us went down to this basement where I witnessed like an incredible jam session. And like I said, again, those are my favorite moments. So um, the book comes out that I, you know, worked on with Ron Wood. And there's this big, uh, you know, party in London for it that Bill Wyman attended there. And, um, and of course, the minute Ron Wood sees me wearing this tie, uh, he never let me forget it, and he said, oh, nice to see that Colonel Kentucky is here. <laughs> and that became my new nickname, Colonel Kentucky. Um, but uh, this was at an art exhibition that tied in with our book publication, and, um, and like I said, it was in London, and Bill Wyman came. Mick Jagger was in town in London at that time, but he did not come, and Ron Wood was kind of upset with that, but Mick sent a telegram saying, break a leg, Leonardo. Um, and so uh, Ron Wood and I then flew back together to, uh, to the States after this night. And we pulled an all-nighter so that we could make the flight. Uh, it was like a 7 a.m. flight or 9 a.m., something like that. We had to leave at 7. And we just said, you know what, let's not go to sleep. So uh, some course during the night, we, um, well, at one point we actually watched a World Series game. Uh, I think it was the Cardinals against the Royals. And uh, I was trying to teach Ron Wood the game of baseball, which he did not take to it. Uh, and he was just making jokes the whole time. And so, you know, when the announcer said, two balls on Ozzie Smith, Ron Wood said, I hope so. <laughs> um, uh, I wasn't supposed to work blue, right? Um, but anyway, um, so, uh, so then we pop in a video uh, of the pretenders. And Ron Wood says to me, I just found out that I shagged her, shagged Chrissy Hine. And I'm like, what, what, like, what? <laughs> now, first of all, the word shag was not even part of the lexicon back then. It was like strictly a British word, but I could kind of figure out like what he meant. Um, but like, what do you mean you just found out? Well, it turns out that Chrissy Hine from The Pretenders, um, she was a fan of Ron Wood's earlier band, which was Rod Stewart and the Faces. And when they played in her town in Ohio in 1972, uh, Chrissy Hine and her friend went to the concert. After the concert, they went back to the hotel, and Chrissy Hine's friend wound up with Rod. Chrissy Hine wound up with Ronnie Wood and didn't tell him about it for 15 years. So, you know, I thought that was pretty cool to have bedded Chrissy Hine and not remembered it. I was like, wow, the, the life of a rock star. <laughs> but um, here we are back in New York, me and Ronnie. <laughs> this is at a club called The Limelight, uh, which actually was a deconsecrated church that got turned into a, a nightclub and is now a shopping mall by the way but that's a whole other story uh, and this was in the library of the club well it was the library of the church originally but now it was still a library in the club but I don't know why I don't think anybody that hung out in that room like knew how to read um, because this is where Ron Wood met most of his drug connections and so this is where the point uh, where I tell you that the interesting thing uh, about my book and about my life with the Stones is that I never did drugs with them, believe it or not, but it's true. And one of the reasons is, and I was talking to some students earlier about this, I was totally driven as, as a journalist and as a business person to get out the newsletter and to be sober and to remember every experience. Um, I mean, as a fan, I wanted to remember every experience. Like, oh my God, I'm hanging out in Keith Richards' house. I'm hanging out in Ron Wood's house. You know, my favorite rock stars. I want to remember every minute of this. 
And then also as a journalist, I want to remember every minute of this. And then as a business person, it's like, well, I can't just like, you know, get drunk and then just spend the whole day on the floor or something when I have the newsletter to get out. People are sending me money, you know. I, so if I was any kind of a holic, I was a workaholic, but I never did drugs with these guys. But boy, I saw a lot of it around them, I have to tell you. Uh, and, you know, occasionally I would you know, have a little drink, you know, with them, it, mostly because I had no choice. If you're hanging out in Keith Richards or Ron Wood's house, I think like Jack Daniels came out of the tap. I mean, there was like, <laughs> there was nothing else to drink. So um, anyway, this is an image uh, from our book that Ron Wood did of. Now I want to see how many, do you, you guys know who, who that is? I know you know. Some of the students, students. Groucho Marx, yes, very good. Um, and so that's one of the pictures that was in our book. I'll tell a quick uh, kind of uh, blue story. So uh, Ron Wood met Groucho Marx in Los Angeles in the mid-'70s, and uh, it was at Groucho's Passover Seder, believe it or not. And Ron Wood was not actually invited, but he knew people who knew Groucho, brought him over. And uh, first thing that Groucho says when he opens the door is, now that's the silliest haircut I've ever seen. But anyway... Um, at the end of the Passover Seder, uh, they're getting ready to leave, Ron Wood and his friend, Elliot Gould, the actor. Um, and Groucho takes Ron Wood around, shows him his house, his mansion, and he says, look at all this. Look at all this wealth. I would give it all up if I could just get one more erection. <laughs> so there you go. Okay, that's as dirty as I'm going to get tonight. That's it. But okay. Um, so uh, Keith Richards, like I said, he... Oh, this is to prove that I'm not a complete teetotaler. Yes, I have some Jack Daniels in there. And, um, and so this is at a party for Keith Richards' Talk is Cheap album. And so as much as he always put the stones above, you know, his own pursuits, he did finally do a solo album after Mick had released two solo albums and it looked like the Rolling Stones might break up, actually, because of this rift between Mick and Keith. Keith finally said, all right, I will do a solo album. And that's taken at a party. Um, for Keith's Talk is Cheap album. And now it's 1988, and I'm 20, well, 25, going on 26 there. Um, and so uh, a few weeks after this party, I hold a party because now it's 10 years of my newsletter. And I want to thank everybody who was involved in it in every way, shape, or form. So like the kid that got me into the mimeograph room in high school, I want to invite him. I want to invite you know, anybody who helped me, people that work for the Stones. I want to invite the Stones themselves, of course. Um, but they were all out of town except for Keith. And uh, there I am wearing that damn tie again. I don't know. I, I just was hooked on that tie for a couple of years. Colonel Kentucky. But anyway, so that's uh, Keith Richards' wife, Patty Hansen, in the middle. And uh, the woman on the right was one of Keith's backup singers. Um, her name is Sarah Dash. She used to play with Patti LaBelle and the Blue Bells, who are from this area. And, um, but anyway, she was singing with Keith Richards. So anyway, they come to my party and Patty Hansen sends her regrets and says, Keith can't come because he has a rehearsal for his solo concert tour. So he can't come. And I said, okay, that's fine. You know, you came and that's great. Uh, and so then, you know, I get up on stage to thank everybody at my party. And I uh, make a little offhanded joke as I'm you know, leaving the stage. Oh, by the way, I'm sure a lot of you came here because you think that the Stones are going to be here. Well, guess what? They're not. I'm sorry, but they're not coming. Well, guess what? The joke was on me because Keith Richards was standing there the whole time. And while I was up on the stage with the lights in my eyes, I didn't see that he was standing right there. But as soon as I came off the stage, he was there. And it was like so gratifying to see him there. And like, wow, like in a way it came full circle. Here's me trying to get into Rolling Stones parties as a teenager, and now Keith Richards is coming to my party. So it was just like a great affirmation, uh, you know, of all the stuff that I had been trying to do. And I, and I guess you could almost read it on my face, just how gratifying it is. So one little thing is, um, you know, like I said, I want to thank everyone, uh, you know, that had helped me in the previous 10 years. And, you know, I mean, my parents were, you know, essential to my success because they gave me enough rope to hang myself. And I think in some ways it was reverse psychology that they gave me all this trust because I did not abuse that trust. Like I said earlier, I had this strong sense of responsibility. And I, uh, you know, I mean, 
when you come in and say, you know, I'm quitting school to run off with a rock band, you know, whatever, you know, I come from a Jewish household where it's like, oh, my son, the doctor, my son, the lawyer. But my parents got to say my son who's running around with a bunch of drug addict rock stars. <laughs> but they knew that I would not become one of those drug addicts. They just had that trust in me and they were right. And like, wow, now the kid has a business that at that point was 10 years, you know. So I, I wanted to invite my parents, but I thought, no, maybe I shouldn't because they're not going to fit in. They're too old. They're not going to fit in. Everybody's in their 20s. My parents at that point were in their mid-50s. Um, but I, I wound up inviting them, and I'm so glad because they're so proud of me. And, uh, well, they wind up meeting Keith Richards which is something I never thought would happen. So yes, that's mom and that's dad. There's Keith, that's Keith's manager, a woman named Jane Rose. And um, I mean, here's my parents, the two kosher deli workers from Brooklyn <laughs> meeting Keith Richards. In fact, I, I later told people like, just imagine Dracula meeting the Costanzas. That's like the <laughs> only, how else do you describe it? But anyway, um, so I found out cause I, I, I wasn't even, I was on the other side of the room. I had so many people at this party that I was talking to that all of a sudden I see all these snapshots and I'm like, what is going on on the other side of the room? I was like, what can this be? My parents are talking to Keith. I was so busy that I'd never thought about introducing them. Didn't think that they would want to meet Keith Richards, but I was wrong because they knew Keith was a very important part of my life. So what I found out happened is that Keith is walking through the room. My dad grabs him by the shoulder and says, hey, Keith, we're Bill's parents. And Keith turns around and says, well, you've got quite a boy there. <laughs> and I later told Keith that surely this is a sign of the apocalypse, you <laughs> meeting my parents. But anyway, I mean, it was just a great gratifying, you know, night for me and really like brought things full circle for 10 years uh, of doing the newsletter and, you know, just like a business that I stumbled into just because I was so passionate about journalism and about the Rolling Stones and look now. So, um, now we get to 1989, and um, they embark on their Steel Wheels tour, which again started right here in Philadelphia. It was supposed to be a JFK stadium, but they condemned JFK, and so they had to switch it to the vet. Um, and that issue, you know, talks about that. Steel Wheels get rolling. And, um, but what started to happen now, I mean, after people thought that the Stones were going to break up, they actually do reunite in 1989 for their Steel Wheels tour. And they break all kinds of attendance records and gross records. Um, and in some ways, it started to turn me off and make things more difficult for me. Because, you know, I'm a capitalist and the Stones deserve to make as much money as, you know, as they want. But uh, they started charging exorbitant amounts of money for their tickets and it kind of priced out some of their fans, their loyal fans. And so, you know, that again is maybe a message to business people is like, don't, you know, you need to, it's a two way street. The people that were loyal to you all these years, you need to be loyal back to them. And I kind of felt the stones weren't doing that by charging these exorbitant amounts because I heard from people who told me that they couldn't afford it. They started charging like $250 for some of the tickets, like when they played Atlantic City, um, you know, and got involved with Donald Trump was like the, the promoter of that show. Um, and now, you know, you go to see the Stones and it's up to like $450. And so that started to turn me off from it. And also the more that money got involved, um, the access to them became a little tougher. They started surrounding themselves by more and more people, publicists, lawyers, accountants, managers, and all that. And so it started to take the fun out of it for me. Um, but I kept it going for a while. And then I wound up, you know, going on another tour with them, their Voodoo Lounge tour in 1994, 95. Um, but finally, after 17 years, I just kind of had to wrap things up because I just got tired of dealing with Mick Jagger's moodiness and with all the managers and lawyers and accountants. And so I still love the journalism aspect. I still love the business aspect of it. Still love the Stones as performers. To this day, I still do. I thought Mick was great the other night on the Grammys. But it just became too much of a grind, you know. Plus, you know, don't forget, like I was saying, this is back in the days of snail mail. And so I was still doing snail mail and licking stamps and licking envelopes and going to the printer and then going to the post office. And so I just got tired of it. And so Mick and Keith and Ronnie Wood all uh, wrote nice little farewell letters. And this is Ronnie's. He also did a drawing. Like I said, he's an artist. And uh, he, th that was a briefcase that I always used to bring over to his house. The BB stands for Beggar's Banquet, the name of my newsletter. He put a banana in my hand. That was a running joke because whenever I went to his house, I would eat a banana that he had on the fruit, in the fruit bowl on his table. 
Uh, but anyway, uh, dear Bill, we shall miss the great instructional monthly. I don't even know what that means, instructional month. We, we will miss the great instructional monthly very much. How will we know from now on where we all are and what each of us has been up to? They used to use my newsletter to find out what the others were doing, you know, halfway around the world. Don't disappear too long. We want you near for the next thing. Uh, and so, yeah, I was really touched by that and like the really cute drawing. It, it really did look like me. So, uh, yeah, it was really nice. And so anyway, my book captures all this whole 17 year story with all the ups and downs and the highs and the lows and um, a lot of like the spinal tap type of moments with the Rolling Stones that you wouldn't think the Stones, you know, would have experienced, you know, like I said, you know, just the fact that they met my parents, you know, is like strange enough. So anyway, um, if you guys have any questions, throw them on up. I'll be glad to answer. I think there's a few books here that will be given out at some point. Uh, let's start right here. Um, wow, that's a good question. I, I think um, sometimes it's a little hard to listen to them at times today because so many memories, even like good memories, I'll, I'll put it to you this way, when I go see them, which I'll still go see them if they do a concert, you know, it's been a few years, but I, I saw them, well, in 2006, I saw them at the Beacon Theater. They turned it into a movie called Shine a Light. But when I'm sitting there watching the Stones, I get all these flashbacks. And so like my mind starts to wander and I'm not even like paying attention to the music. And it's like, wow, now I'm remembering like spilling the orange juice on mixed rug or, you know, all these other experiences. So I'm just saying I still enjoy the music, but it has different associations for me now. So uh, right there. Among all members of the band you talked about, seems like the only one that you didn't really explicitly talk about was Charlie Watts. <laughs> yes. So I was wondering if you ever had a chance to talk to him, if there was a personality behind that blank stare he demonstrated. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm glad you asked that. And actually, people usually do say that at the end of this presentation. Like, wait, you didn't mention Charlie Watts at all. Well, yeah, there's a reason for that. And he is a very, um, boy, introverted guy. He's very nice, but he's very introverted. He's a bit eccentric, too. He's like a real, like one of these rich British eccentric guys. He collects cars, like Lamborghinis, even though he doesn't drive. Um, he has, collects horses, and supposedly he lets the horses roam through the house which like that's a heck of a cleanup job, I'm sure. Um, so, you know, but a very nice guy, just a little strange, eccentric and introverted above all. So there were points when I was like this close to him, if not closer, you know, and I mean, I, I met him a bunch of times and shook his hand and we would say hello, but I never had like a meaningful conversation with him. Um, and part of it was just like, wow, like I, we have nothing in common. Keith Richards and Ron Wood and Mick Jagger, at least like they lived in New York and they considered themselves New Yorkers for a very long time. Charlie Watts was like, you know, what does Charlie Watts have in common with me? And so I just never like found any common ground with him to talk to him about. But a nice guy, just very introverted. And yeah, I mean, a little strange on stage, you could see it. And so that's him in real life. Uh, yes, over here. Have you read Keith Richards' autobiography? I've only had a chance to thumb through it looking for the, the parts that I personally witnessed. Um, but people are telling me that he comes off looking nicer in my book than in his own book, actually. Um, but uh, I, I caught a few inaccuracies, mostly like chronological things, uh, like not that big of a deal. Um, but, you know, I enjoyed what I've read. But, you know, I've heard complaints from fans. I'm who, just curious if your version of Keith or how you, the Keith you know lines up with what, you know, what you've seen from, from the book. Well, that's the thing. You know, people are telling me that Keith uh, in his own book has like this real like cocky kind of arrogant, attitude and that's not the Keith Richards that I knew at least during the time period that I knew him I really I haven't been in touch with these guys in a while you know I saw Ron Wood a few years ago but uh, and it sounds weird to Rolling Stones fans that I kind of pulled myself away in order to write this book which took me a very long time to do I was just telling some people earlier it took me 12 years beginning to end to write this book um, you know I would put it down for a few months pick it back up but while I was writing this book I just wanted to focus on the memories and so I kind of pulled away from the Stones. And I also knew that I would be critical of the Stones at times, like their, some of their business practices, like I was discussing earlier. Um, so I said, let me just like pull away from, from them. Um, so, you know, I haven't, you know, heard from them what they think of my book. I haven't heard directly anyway. I've heard from some of Keith Richards' friends, and they all love it, like his closest friends and relatives, actually. But Keith, uh, I haven't heard from directly. He's 
not the kind of guy that picks up the horn or you know doesn't text you know lol you know my bff you know that is not keith richards he doesn't call people i mean even a telephone is too advanced for him uh -huh. anybody else yes Uh, I would have delegated authority, yeah. I, I was a one-man band, for better or for worse, and um, it, like, it made me crazy at times. I mean, this was like a 25-hour day occupation. And, you know, because of the nature of what it was, my, my social life and my work life were blurred. Because, you know, I love the Rolling Stones. And so it was, you know, it was a hobby. I actually, I make a point early in the book. I talk about one of my teachers, my social studies teacher. And I finally show him my newsletter. And um, he says, Billy, the problem with mixing hobby and profession is that, yes, it'll make your work feel like fun. But eventually, it will make your hobby feel like work. And that is something that happened, you know. So... I think if I had delegated authority, you know, maybe I would have had an easier go at, uh, you know, in certain respects. On both sides, I would have enjoyed the music even more, and I would have, you know, been more focused as a, a business person by just saying, do this, do this, do this. But, you know, the, the part of it is that I didn't charge enough money for subscriptions. You know, I'm charging $3. I remember when I upped it to $4.00. You know, this is in the early 80s when I'm still a teenager, and that was like a big deal. Like, everybody, I hope this is okay. I'm charging $4 a year now. And in fact, people would send me a $5 bill in the mail, and they would say, you know, here, keep the extra, you know, go have a drink or something. And I would actually make change through the mail and send them back a dollar because I did not want to keep a dollar. But I don't need charity. So, <laughs> yes, sir. That's another thing I get asked about. Um, and they really didn't, actually. And one of the things that disappoints me um, is that they kind of like gloss over his importance. Like nowadays, they really don't talk about him. And I mean, I know that they personally resented him. He did quit the band in some ways. You know, he was pushed out. You know, uh, as some of you may or may not know, Brian Jones is an original member of the Stones. And he quit in 1969 and then died three weeks later in his swimming pool under suspicious circumstances. Uh, mostly a drug overdose, but people are saying he was murdered, you know, whatever. But, um, but no, they really didn't. And uh, to me, you know, and Keith was so open with me about so many things, like I said, his drug addictions and the fact that he didn't talk to his father for 20 years and all that. But when it came to Brian Jones, he didn't volunteer anything about Brian. And, and I, that was like one topic that I was a little too scared to ask about because I sense that there was like still tension to this day. And some people tell me that you know, he does disparage Brian in his autobiography. Um, the only one clue that he gave me was I got him to talk about John Belushi because Keith knew John Belushi. And Keith was with Belushi like a couple of weeks before Belushi died. And Keith said that John Belushi and Brian Jones had the same kind of vibe, which was an overdo it kind of vibe. And the more you would tell them, you know, you didn't know how to handle it because you, the more you would tell them like, hey, you got to dial it back a bit then th the more they would just overdo it more and more and more. And like I said, Brian Jones winds up dead at the bottom of his swimming pool, and John Belushi pretty much the same thing without the swimming pool. Um, yes, first there and then there. Outside the Stones, who's the coolest person or your favorite person? Um, Clapton's up there. Um, it was great meeting Chuck Berry also, but he is just the nastiest guy, you know, <laughs> But, and even Keith Richards, so, you know, Keith Richards, his idol was Chuck Berry growing up. You know, Chuck Berry's now like 84, 85 years old. And he loved Chuck Berry, but uh, he wound up working with Chuck Berry. And one of the things Keith told me about Chuck Berry was that meeting Chuck Berry and working with Chuck Berry taught him that just because you love someone's work doesn't mean you have to love them as a person. So, which is kind of how I feel about Mick Jagger, I guess. So, oh, wait, we had one here first. Um, yeah, yeah, they have like no real ill will, I think, you know, because Keith sometimes feels betrayed. Anybody who leaves the Stones, you know, he kind of feels betrayed, you know, a sense of betrayal. Keith sometimes views the Stones like the mafia, you know, you're in, you're in, you know, the only way out is in a casket, you know, that's it. Um, and Mick Taylor, you know, is still alive. I was going to say alive and well, he's not that well, he's been sick the last couple of years. Um, but um, 
I got to interview Mick Taylor. I have a whole chapter about it in the book. And, and I, I kind of felt that even though he said he had no regrets for quitting, um, I sensed that maybe he did kind of. He was very introspective. And obviously, he never did anything as lucrative or artistically rewarding as he did with the Stones. But you know, I was asked this question earlier tonight, who do I think is better, a better guitarist, Ron Wood or Mick Taylor? Yes, Mick Taylor's a better guitarist. But Ron Wood brought that energy back to the Stones that they really needed in the late 70s. And so I think they're still around because of him. Back there. Can you point to the genius in the group? To the genius in the group? Well, it's this complementary relationship of Mick and Keith. Yeah, well, it's, I think it's the relationship of Mick and Keith. And, uh, you know, I was discussing this earlier with some folks, as you know, that, you know, Mick is the business guy. You know, he's a great singer and great performer, obviously. But in terms of the everyday running of the Rolling Stones, he's in charge of the business department, and Keith is in charge of the music department. And, you know, they both need each other and have this complementary relationship. You know, because uh, if Keith let down the musical side, then they would have not lasted for almost 50 years. And if Mick let down the business side, they could not have lasted. But here they are. They might go on tour next year, and it'll be their 50th anniversary. And it's amazing, you know. And, you know, what they've done in terms of business and merchandising and branding, you know, that I would assume is the most famous logo in rock and roll is that tongue logo, you know. And so that's all Mick stuff. You know, he's the one that actually came up with the idea for the tongue. And, uh, you know, but again, you need Keith to keep the music side honest. So that's, I think, where the genius is, is in their relationship. And I will say this, that when they're not relating well, that's when the Stones kind of suffer. And that's why I think some of their albums, like they did this one album, Bridges to Babylon, I thought was horrible because it was like two solo albums and they weren't really working together on it. And, you know, or the Dirty Work album, I guess, is not a great album. You know, sentimental value for me because I was there for the recording of it in New York, but, but not a great album. And so I, I, I think as, this, as Mick and Keith's relationship goes, that's how the Stones go. Uh, other questions? Yeah, back here. Well, I think what he's saying, at least for me, anyway, some of the orchestration, like, you can't always get what you want. You know, it's not just the guitar. You know, the whole the orchestra music and background singers, and somebody's got to be helping. Yeah. Orchestra. Well, that was also their producer, Jimmy Miller, uh, did, you know, he, he actually produced the, f like, four great albums, you know, that's part of the Stones canon. And so if, if any of the younger people want to know, like, which Stones albums, if I had to name four, I would say from a Beggar's Banquet to Let It Bleed to Sticky Fingers to Exile on Main Street, which goes from 68 to 72. And then Stuck in the Middle is a great live album, which was the first Stones record I ever heard, which was Get Your Yaya's Out which was recorded in 1969. So actually, if you did those five, then you're doing pretty good with the Stones. Obviously, they've done some good stuff since, but that's really the core of the Stones' career. Uh, anybody else? You can take, you can take two, more questions. two more questions. No more hands. Ah, yes, in the green. Well, you know, it really, like, it came in stages, you know, so... But I guess when I got that phone call when I'm 20 years old and they say, you know, they want to turn your little fanzine into their official newsletter and it's going to be advertised in their next album and you'll get to interview them and blah, 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 blah. I guess that was sort of the confirmation. And that's when, like, I, I literally saw it on paper, you know. And so I think that maybe is when it really started to sink in. In the back. Do you know what they thought of the Beatles? They loved the Beatles. I don't know why fans sing as like Beatles versus the Stones. And I actually, I did an interview a few months ago on NPR where it was like Beatles versus Stones Day. And so I obviously took the Stones side. And, um, and they had some guy, you know, debating me with the Beatles, like, who's better, you know. I was like, you know, nobody's better. And they actually, they loved each other. They really did as friends and as artists. And in fact, one of the things some people don't realize is that when they were both around at the same time in the 60s, they used to coordinate with each other. So, well, when is your album coming out? All right, well, we'll hold ours back for two weeks and, you know, and all that. But one of the things that got resolved on that NPR thing was, because they needed to get like a resolution at the end of it, was that the, the Stones were a better live band, but the Beatles were a better studio band, which I guess I could agree with, you know, sort of. <laughs> uh, did we have one last question somewhere? Yes. 
you know, just, uh, just very loosely, I still have a website. I actually still I have a couple of websites, one that's uh, about the book, that's BillGerman.com, and then one where I'm still selling back issues of the old newsletter, uh, and that's called BeggarsBanquetOnline.com. And so to keep people coming back, you know, I'll occasionally put little bits of news. And um, yeah, and I still know so many fans that I still find out what's going on and, you know, so yeah, Mick is on the Grammys or, you know, a couple of them might be playing together in London in a few weeks. So yeah, I mean, I'm still kind of on top of it, but not as fanatically and not in any way really professionally anymore. But yeah, I mean, if they come around, I would go see them, you know, once or twice as opposed to, you know, some of the other tours where I would go see, you know, a dozen, two dozen, three dozen times, you know, it became like a day at the office, actually. So is that it? Uh, oh, hey. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming. Again, I, I want to thank um, the Business and Entertainment Society, um, uh, the ICE people, ICE Cap people, and, uh, and uh, Dean German for, and everybody that coordinated it for me, Jim and Pat and all the great people here. And I love meeting the students. I got to have a one-on-one -on -one with some of you guys earlier. And I was saying that it restores my faith in the future. You know, I'm a news junkie still, and I see all these horrible things in the news about young people. But I come here tonight and see like, wow, we're doing okay. So thanks for having me.